Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Please open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. It's in your bulletin, also on the screen, but it would be most helpful if you had it in your own Bible, in your own device. Would like to say welcome to Emi san and uh, Kusakai san. Uh, welcome. And if there is someone who can translate, that would be very helpful for uh, Kusakai san or to her son. Uh, someone who's Japanese who could translate into Japanese. Uh, it's okay. You can talk louder than me. There's no competition. Uh, but however you want to do it, it's up to you. Okay. <clears throat> um, We'll begin with the title. Uh, the title says, uh, Faithful Through Compromise. <clears throat> and uh, the word compromise, I just want to explain to some of the Japanese speakers. Uh, compromise, uh, the word translated in your dictionary would be the word uh, dakyo, dakyo suru. And, uh, that's half of the meaning. Dakyo uh, or compromise uh, would be something like in a business relationship, if you want someone to give you something, uh, you give something in return. Like my mom, she's very good uh, when she's buying something, they ask for $100 and my mom will say, $25 just cold-blooded and then the the store clerk will say okay okay $90 and my mom will say $25 and uh, then the store clerk will say okay 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 $80 and she'll say 30 and and then they meet somewhere in the middle a kind of compromise uh, in, in English we could say give and take right so that's uh, one way that you can understand compromise, but that's not the only meaning in the English language of compromise, of dakyo. There's also a negative uh, meaning, uh, and maybe I looked it up, it's something like setchu uh, suru, setchu, which is uh, like something like corruption. And it's a kind of moral uh, compromise, which means like, uh, you you have a good intention and you want something to do that's good but there is a kind of evil alongside that wants to make you settle dakyosu or compromise or be corrupted you can think of a, a politician that uh, is trying to help a city but there are uh, people in the city who have money and they want to influence the politician so that the politician will give them favor instead of another group and so the politician compromises to the people with the money and he doesn't help the people with no money and that's a kind of setchu or compromise or corruption. So that is the idea in the title, faithful through compromise. Uh, before we go into the text, I need to tell you a story. It's about a group of people who were set free. They were migrating into their freedom. They were saved out of slavery, out of exploitation, and they were moving through a portion of land and they wanted to get into the next part of the land. And this section of land it was called Moab, and there was the leader of that section called Balak. He was a kind of leader, a kind of king, a kind of warlord. He controlled the area of Moab 
And he saw the people coming, and he was afraid that these people would enter into his territory, and he would have no more territory. So he called a certain uh, witch doctor, a kind of uh, magician, sorcerer. And his name was Balaam. Uh, he came from um, a place near Babylon. And he was famous for having power. Whenever Balaam would pray a, a blessing on someone, then they would be blessed. But when Balaam would pray a curse over someone, they would be cursed. So he had power. So Balak, the king of Moab, calls Balaam and he says, please come and curse these people. They're the Israelites. So he calls them and Balaam comes. And you can read this story in the Bible, in the book of Numbers chapter 25 through 31 and what happens is Balaam tries to curse the people of Israel but three times he ends up blessing them so he he wants to curse them and in his mind he's thinking curse 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 but when it comes out of his mouth it's blessing And what Balak, the king, is thinking, ah, how, how can I get these people? And so Balaam, he gets it. We cannot defeat these people, these Israelites, directly. We cannot wipe them out or take them away through the front. So what we'll do? is we'll come through the side. So he tells Balak, Balak, there's no curse on them from above, so let's not curse them, let's compromise them. Let's corrupt them. Here's what you do. You get the women from your towns. You let them come to the Israelites, and you let them wear their bikinis and maybe some short skirts. Let them bring some wine. Let them be singing and dancing. And you let the men of Israel see the women of Moab. And that's how you get them. And that's exactly what they did. And so Balaam is known as a false teacher or a false prophet who taught Balak how to corrupt the people of God through compromise, especially sexual compromise. I want to show you how the work of compromise happens in our life. It's very subtle. And compromise can happen very quickly through a thought from one thought all the way into the action it can happen in a moment or compromise can happen over a week a month a year and you look back and you thought oh dear I am in a mess because of my compromise and Jesus says, I want to save you. I want to help you because you know the mess that you are in. No one can get you out except me. Because Jesus has people in this room right here. And he has people in this room he has saved out of slavery. He has pulled you out 
of some ugly, dark mess. Amen. Amen. Out of something that this world has pounded you and grounded you into, and Jesus is pulling you out. And you know what? You're coming out. You're walking through into a place, a place of freedom. And so there is an enemy of Jesus. And if he's the enemy of Jesus, he is an enemy of you. And now the enemy knows I can't get him directly. I'm going to go through the side. If I can't go through the side, I'm going to come up underneath. If I can't come under, I'm going to find somewhere through the, you know, I'm going to find you. So that's where we are today. Faithful through compromise. How does Jesus keep us faithful through compromise? Pergamum. We read in Revelation chapter 2. This is the third church that this letter is going to. There was Ephesus down over here. And then you go up a little bit, about uh, 50 kilometers. There's a place called Smyrna. And then you go off of the coast and into the land a little bit. And there's a place called Pergamum. And let's read it together. There's three parts to this letter. The good, the bad, and then the beautiful at the end. So, uh, let me read verses 12 through 15. Please join me at verse 16. 16. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. And likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Let's read together. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. These are the words of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So, Pergamum, Pergamum, it was known as the gateway to civilization. It was a, an easternmost city. Uh, it was a, 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 a very high, lofty city. There's the plains below. And then 1,000 feet up the mountain is the city of Pergamum. And there is where the east would meet the west. If you wanted to come into ancient, western, Greek, Roman civilization, you came to the gateway, which was Pergamum. Pergamum was a center for learning and education. There was a god of education. People worshipped education, education, education. Uh, it was famous for its library. It had 2,000 over 2,000 volumes handwritten. It was in competition with Egypt, the city of Alexandria, 
was also a very ancient and famous library. And they were so jealous of Pergamum, they stopped sending paper to Pergamum. Ancient texts are written in papyrus, right? Uh, that's from Egypt. And Alexandria, the city in Egypt, said, all right, no more paper to Pergamum. So what they did was Pergamum, they made their own paper, and it's called parchment. Parchment comes from the word Pergamum. And they ended up having their own uh, system of publishing on this parchment. And you actually read that in the Bible. A lot of the Bible was actually written on parchment originally, the New Testament. And they worshipped uh, education and being so wise and so learned. But not only education, they, they worshipped, uh, of course they worshipped the emperor. They were the first city that, that built a, a temple to a living emperor. So that means Rome loved Pergamum. Gave them all the money they wanted. Pergamum was not only the place where they loved education, they loved uh, sexuality, they loved freedom and open sexuality. They also had, uh, 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 they loved the body. And so they sometimes would worship the body. They worshiped health. There was a statue, a temple of the god, uh, As, uh, I'm gonna try to pronounce it right, Ascalapus, Ascalapius. Uh, he was the god of healing. For those of you who are familiar with the medical profession, uh, many of the Western symbols of medicine is a staff with a snake wrapped around it, maybe two snakes. That was the emblem of the god Ascalapus, who was the healing god. And what they would do is they would have this temple, and in the temple there would be snakes crawling all over the temple. Some of you are already hating this sermon because of the snakes and everywhere, right? And so what you would do is if you had a sickness, you would go to the temple and you would lay down on the floor of the temple, maybe one night, two nights, three nights, you would let the snakes crawl all over you. And, and it would be the power of Escalapis crawling all over your body for healing. The book of Revelation describes Satan as the great serpent, the giant snake. And it's interesting that they would call the city the place where Satan lives. In fact, it says there's the throne of Satan. The throne of Satan. You know, there's another meaning for that. Not only did they have the God of education, the God of, of uh, Diana, Dionysus, for sexuality, not only for education, not only for healing and health, but the, also there was the God of Zeus, or excuse me, Zeus. And they would have the temple dedicated to Zeus. And he would have the highest place in the city. So you're at the bottom of the plane and you look up the city, 1,000 feet up, and you could see on top of the mountain a giant temple. And at the temp, the, the, the temple was the shape of a horseshoe, kind of half circle. And at the top, right there in the middle of that half circle, was a giant throne. Sitting on the throne was Zeus. And John says, that's the place where Satan has his throne. Because you're not worshiping Zeus. You're not worshiping health. You're not worshiping edic. You're worshiping Satan. Because if it's not the God who made everything, you're going to worship the one who's trying to destroy everything. And so here's Jesus. He says, you know what? I get it. I know where you live. I get it. I understand. You live in a very difficult place. 
Now, why is it difficult? Are they attacking you? Are they grounding and pounding you like Smyrna? Ah, they did that in the past. Last week, we talked about Smyrna. They were crushing them. Well, they tried that with Pergamum. They had uh, one of the pastors, a man named Antipas. And they took him, and they put him inside of a giant metal bull made out of steel or bronze. And they put the bull over a fire, and they made the fire so hot that the bull was white hot. And they took the leader, probably the pastor of the church in Pergamum named Antipas, and they put him alive into this fiery, white hot, burning bull. And they roasted him alive. You know what? Did that kill the church? Did that stop Christianity? No. It only made it stronger. That's what you do when you try to attack the church. You're only making it stronger. Last week I told you about the church in Nigeria. All the attacks going on in Africa. Uh, of, of, of houses being burnt down, churches being burnt down, of Christians being attacked. Guess where Christianity is growing the strongest in the world? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs, martyrs, the Latin for, or the Greek for martus. Martus is the word we have here Witness, verse uh, 13. My faithful witness is the word martus. We get the word martyr from it. The reason we get the word martyr from this word witness is because it means, it became to mean, those people who were so true to Jesus, they were witnesses until death. They were witnessing, testifying, staying faithful to Jesus until they died for Jesus. That now the meaning of witness becomes martyr. And there you have it. So Satan tried to go direct right into that. And that only made them stronger. So Satan says, okay, we'll come in through the side. We can't get them through the promise of death. We'll get them through the promise of sex. And that's where we get the compromise. So the compromise happens like this. There's three steps to compromise. We can see it right there. The first step to compromise, not to, um, not to, not to a non-Christian. We're talking to the church right now. To the Christians. Here's what happens when compromise starts knocking on your door. First thing, verse 14. Balak entices Israelites to sin, so they ate the food. Ah, yes, right there. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites. The first step in compromise is the head and the heart. Satan will come to, to, to entice you. He comes from your head, he comes for your head with a teaching. It says Balaam taught Balak. And it's a teaching of Balaam. There is a way of thinking that leads to compromise. Here's how it looks. Your body is a good thing. God made the body. Sex is a good thing. And God gave you your body to do whatever you want with it. It's your body. And so these Christians, these Bible people, they want to put limits on how you use your body and how you define your sexuality and how you see your gender. But it's a good thing. It's for you to have and control. You see the thinking there? See the teaching? 
you're, you're, an, you're not a child anymore. You're an adult. You don't need all of these uh, controls on your internet usage. You don't need these, these locks on the, these certain sites. Come on. It's only YouTube. It's only Facebook. It's for everybody to use. You see the teaching there? See the thinking? Oh, but you're only human. You're a person too. You, you, they, if they can enjoy it, why can't you? So that's the first step. It, it creeps in. It's very subtle. And it gets into your heart. And so there's the word entice. Entice. There's a certain idea that it will give you the pleasure or the fulfillment or the satisfaction that you are looking for. I can't get it at church. So I need to get it somewhere. And there's an emotional attachment now that's beginning to grow. That's the first step in compromise. It's the thinking and the feeling. But that's not it. The next step is where? It says this. Who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols. That's the second step. They ate the food sacrificed to idols. Here's what happened. The women would come with their drinks and their jewelry and their miniskirts and their open blouses. And they would say, come on, come on, come on. And the men would say, okay, I'm coming. And then the women would say, oh, okay, well, you know, now we're together. Now you and me, we're, we're, we're together. We're a couple now. You have to meet my father. You have to meet my mom. And let's go. And the mom and the dad say, oh, you want to be a part of us? You got to go to our temple and you have to eat our meals. And the meals and the, the, the meat would be prayed over through another god. And so now the Israelites are now worshiping and praying to another god. The first step in compromise is mental and emotional exception. Excuse me. Ascension. Acceptance. The second step in compromise is participation. Ascension. Mental, emotional ascension. And then participation. You're not doing it. But you're going to be with them while they do it. And you're just like, oh, okay, this is weird at first. And I'm just going to sit back. But I'll go with you because now we're together. And I'm just going to watch. But I'm not going to do anything. But I'm, I'm just, I'm here. I have to be here now. I'm attached. Participation. I'm going to go along. But I'm going to just, you know, be in the back. Whatever. What happens next? Enticement, they were taught, they were enticed, then they participated, and finally, and committed sexual immorality. Before they knew it, they were doing it. Now that could happen just like that. I'm on the internet, I'm thinking, ah, oh, this is fine, and before I knew it, I've gone from enticement to participation to committing sexual sin. Ah, she, she's a nice girl. She knows me. I know her. We, we get along. We're good people. And before you know it, you're, ch you're in chains. You're trapped. And you say you're a Christian. Okay, now we need to do something about that. Here's the thing about Jesus. Uh, we read the first part, verse 12 at the very top. These are the words of him who has... The sharp, double-edged sword. The sharp, double-edged sword. I need to go back for just a minute. Just please bear with me. Pergamum. Pergamum. It was the place where they had the proconsul of Rome. The proconsul of Rome would be the judge. And the symbol for the authority of the judge was called the just gladi. 
The sword of authority. The sword that the judge held was a sharp, double-edged sword. And it was his symbol for his authority. He held it, which meant he was the one who could decide good or evil, innocent or guilty, right or That was the double-edged sword. It wasn't for fighting, okay? But Jesus will fight. I'll get to that in a minute. What was the sword for? It was for dividing. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. What does it say? The Word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. Now why? So that it could stab and it slice it? No, 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 no. The sharpness is about judgment. The sharpness is to say, the bone and the marrow, there's a line right here. And we're going to slice between the, the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And Jesus has the sword of his authority. And he's not coming here to slice you, not yet. But he's coming here to say, look, there's some who are falling into compromise. And Pastor Chris... Pastor Kevin, Pastor Hiroshi, they're not the ones to do the slicing. Because I can't look at you and say, you're a Christian. You are not a Christian. You're a disciple. You are fake. I can't do that. I love you all. I wish all of you were believers. I want all of you to follow Jesus. But the truth is, there's compromise. And the one who will judge that is the one who has the double-edged sword. That's what that sword is for. But let's get back to it. There's the compromise of the people of God in the church at Pergamum. They have allowed themselves to commit sexual immorality with the people of the city. Because the city tried to hurt them one way, and Satan said, let's go around the back door. So how does Jesus save us? Now it's the good news. The good news is repent. Verse 16. It comes through repentance. What is repentance? Metanoia. Very simple. It's changing the heart and the mind with the intent of changing the actions. You change your head and your heart and your hands will follow. That's repentance. Jesus, I hear you saying it. Jesus, I hear you talking to me. Bing! Right between the eyes. I'm going to change. You see, the word in Proverbs, I'm, I'm studying Proverbs this year, and the word for fool in Proverbs is basically the word for matagastang um, ulo. Ulo? Matagastang ulo. A hard head. The word for a stubborn person means, or excuse me, a word for a fool is stubborn. It means, I'm gonna, I know what's wrong, but I'm going to still do it that way. That's the word for a fool in the Bible, okay? And the, what the fool needs is repentance. The head has to change. The heart has to change. Now, here's the thing about you as a Christian. A Christian has the ability to repent. You say, why? How do I get the ability? Here's what you believe. You believe in the cross. You believe that that cross has a meaning in your life. And when you put your trust in the cross, you put your trust in Easter, in the empty grave after the cross. And then, because you put your trust in the empty grave, Jesus puts his spirit inside of you. And when before you tried to change and you wanted to repent, you somehow couldn't do it, but because you trusted in the cross, you have this thing now. It's called God, the Holy Spirit. It's not it, it's he. 
and he is inside of you. This is called the doctrine of regeneration, of conversion, of the new creation, of the new birth. And this Holy Spirit living inside of you is giving you the ability to repent. Why would Jesus tell you to repent if you cannot repent? He's not telling the world to repent. He's telling his church to repent. He's telling you if you would be his. I'm telling you, you can change through my power in you. So you can do it. You can be faithful through the compromise. Here's how. There were three steps to the compromise. There are three steps to the faithfulness. It's right there in your Bible. Okay? The first step in the compromise was thinking and feeling, I can't be satisfied with what the church offers. So I have to get it somewhere else. When you repent, here's what Jesus says. Verse 17. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's the first step. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. 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 The manna was the bread. Israel was walking through the desert, okay? They had no food, there's no convenience stores, there's no service areas, there's no rest stops. They're going through a desert. So God provides food called manna, manna. And it literally said, what is this? I love how in the Japanese you say, kore wa nan desu ka? Nan, right? Nani, right? Nani. That's the word mana, nani. So whenever I go to an Indian restaurant and I eat nan, nan desu ka, I think of mana, nan. I know it's stupid, but it's just my way of thinking, right? <laughs> right? God gave them the bread from heaven, right? Go back into your Bible and go to the book of John, chapter, or excuse me, the Gospel of John. John was the one who wrote Revelation. Go to the Gospel of John. Okay? John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And uh, verse 31. Verse 31. This is people talking to Jesus. Verse 31, 6, 31. Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Verse 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so the people say, verse 34, Sir, give this, from now on, give us this bread. Verse 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life who comes to me. He who comes to me will never go hungry. Did you catch that? Go back to Revelation chapter 2. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. Jesus is the manna. Jesus is the satisfaction. Jesus is the fulfillment. Jesus is what you're looking for. And if you can't find him in the church, go to another church where they'll preach Jesus to you. We preach Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. It's only about Jesus. Look, if Jesus is not your mana, then your mana will be your education. Your mana will be your health. Your mana will be your position, your authority your power, 
your mana will be your, your Facebook account or your likes or your YouTube or your entertainment, your hobby. Your mana will be your job. Your mana will be your spouse, your partner, your husband, your children, your family. There's all kinds of mana out there. They do not satisfy your hunger. Only Jesus satisfies your hunger. He is the mana from heaven. And he will satisfy your soul. And if you will repent, you'll get him. And you'll find your satisfaction. Jesus, be the center of it all. Whom have I in heaven but you? This world has nothing I desire except you. My heart and my flesh my fail. But God is my God forever. He is the mana. That's the first step. Second step. I will give some of the hidden mana. I will also give that person whew, a white stone. Okay. So the mana, it's actually a little bit of a, a hint. When Jesus says, I'll give you the mana, he's saying, I'm going to invite you to a feast. And that feast is what I preached last year in November in Revelation chapter 20. 21, it's the, the banquet, the great banquet of the bridegroom, right? It's the feast. Now, here's the thing about the feasts in Roman uh, culture. The way you get into a feast is you need a shotaijo, an invitation. What is the invitation? A white stone. You get in, and they say, yeah, you got the right clothes. You got the right hair, you got the right name, do you have a white stone? cha -da. Come on in. The white stone is your invitation into the, the banquet, the festival. But, it gets even better. Jesus says, I'll give you a white stone. Let, do you remember the, the judge I told you about, the proconsul? If you committed a crime, or was accused of a crime, you would go to the judge. And the judge would hear your case and hear your, the testimony of everybody else and hear your testimony. And he had on his chair two stones. One stone would be a white stone. The white stone meant not guilty, free, right? Pure, clean. It's the white stone. Guess what color the other stone was? Black. And the black stone meant guilty as charged. Uh, you go to a convenience store like Lawson or 7-Eleven. Behind the counter, have you seen it? They have what's called the Bohan Bowl. No, you don't? Okay. If you go to a convenience store, so in the back, maybe by the microwave, they have these two balls like the size of a baseball. They're orange. Okay? And it says, Boham Bor. What is it for? It's for someone who comes in and maybe they try to steal something and then the clerk sees them and they're trying to run out. They get this Boham Bor and they throw it at the person. And that ball is like a paintball. The outside is just this thin plastic, and if it hits the shirt, it's orange, right? I've never seen it used, I've never seen it ever, in my, but it's so, I was like, Bohan Boy, I looked it up, and there it is. It's a paintball for criminals, so that if you were guilty, you would have the stain of orange guilt all over it, right? So in Roman culture, you have the black ball. And that's where we actually get the expression in English, being blackballed. If you have the black stone, businesses would not commit business with you. Your family would probably no longer accept you. And you definitely do not have friends anymore because you're blackballed. You have the, the black stone of guilt. So there's a boy, 
he wakes up one day and in his hand is a black stone and people see the black stone and they stay away from him so he tries to throw the stone as far as he can throws it into the water and he turns around and there's the stone in his hand <sighs> all right he goes to the shop and he tries to crush the stone with a drill so he crushes the drill or crushes the stone it's all black powder everywhere he leaves the shop he reaches in his pocket there's the black stone all right I can't throw it away I can't destroy it I'll get some paint he goes to the store he paints the stone top bottom sides it's a white stone but his hands begin to get sweaty and the sweat starts rubbing away the white and all he has is the black stone so he's depressed and he's walking on Hondori and there's you know on Hondori there's the part where nobody goes it's like there it's just dark it's just no business it's just a little corner some people put their little stand right so he goes he's walking there and he sees there's an old man there an old man with a table the man's got just he's just dirty you can tell he's been there for a long time and on the table there's a sign that says white stones for sale so he says uh, can I have a white stone and uh, the, the old man says yeah sure and uh, the boy says how much is the white stone and he says it costs your black stone and the boy says what the man says you give me your black stone I'll give you the white stone and you can he sees next to the man is a, a mountain of black stones and a mountain of white stones and he says to the man how did you pay how 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 can I afford this white stone how did you pay for it and the man says I've paid for it all of it I took the price for all of these black stones you just give me yours I'll give you this white one so the boy takes his stone wipes off all of the white paint blows off all of the dust and he gives the man the black stone the man takes it puts it in the, the pile and takes a white stone and gives it to the boy the boy takes the white stone and he goes home Jesus says to his church I have taken all of your black stones all of your guilt all of your shame all of your mess I have a white stone for you it's free but it cost me a whole lot all you do is receive it is anybody here in need of a white stone but the white stone is something very special the third step in repentance you take the white stone and you read it I love what art talked about at the testimony time when art said I gave Micah an email address that only I know there is something written on the white stone that we get from Jesus it's a name that only he knows amen it's like wow um, I, I gave Kyohei my first son he likes to read and I gave him a book <clears throat> the other day because uh, he finished uh, his, his Narnia series he finished The Hobbit um, and I want to give him another book uh, it's by uh, an author named Ursula Le Guin it's uh, it's my 
my third favorite fantasy uh, novels. Uh, it's called The Earth Sea Chronicles. The Earth Sea Chronicles. It's about, it's like a world of magic and power. Be, I know, I'll be careful. And um, it's about a boy who goes to um, a magician's school, a wizard school, and he grows up, and it makes Harry Potter look like garbage. Harry Potter is garbage compared to Ursula Le Guin's Earth Sea Chronicles. So it's about um, the world is is a, about like a set of islands, and uh, on these islands are these people, and they're all dark skinned. Like think like um, Indonesia or, or Malaysia or Southeast Asia. So everybody's dark skinned, but powerful, and it's a world of magic. The secret to the magic is the names. So if you know the name of something, you have the power over that something. So uh, you, 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 uh, you go to a river, and the river has a name. But if you know the name of the river from when it was created, you have power over the water, and you can manipulate the river. Or if you go to an animal, and it's a big beast, and the beast has a name, but if you studied and you know the, the true name of the beast, and you call it by its created name, by the creator, you have power over the beast. And if you go to a person, everybody in this world has a name. It's all nicknames, though. But if you know the true name of that person, you have power over that person because you know that person's identity. The name of that person is their soul, is their essence, yes? Now that has nothing to do with this scripture, but I just had to talk about it. <laughs> because Jesus gives us a stone with a name nobody knows. No one knows. Now we all have our names. Somebody calls you doctor. Somebody calls you teacher. Somebody calls you mother. Somebody calls you friend or or nani nani kun or nani nani sensei or nani nani san or or oh my. Maybe that's your name. Just oh my. Right? But Jesus has a name for you that no one else knows because he knows your true identity he knows your essence and if you will put your trust in him you get the name you get your true identity your true you become what you are made for because he was the one who made you and because he made you, he knows what you are made for. You are made for him. And he will give you exactly what you need. A new name, a new heart, a new mind, a new life. You will be a new creation. Why? Why? Because he is the one whose name is above every name. He's the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. He is God to the glory of God the Father. Yes. And He will give you everything you need to be faithful through all this compromise. You can do it because He loves you. He saved you. He rescued you. He has the power of the authority. So just go to him. I love what it says in today's bulletin. <clears throat> the very end. The Spirit of God gives you not only spiritual birth, but also spiritual awakening. No, that's not there. Ha. Huh. What do we do about it? Seek Jesus through his word and spirit. Pray for new affections. 
Ah, 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 there it is. Run to Jesus. Dissatisfaction of your cold love is often a motivation to seek God for personal revival and renewal. Run to Jesus. That's some good stuff right there. I want to invite you in your heart, in your mind, run to Jesus. Run to Him. Run to His cross. And bow. Would you bow with me? Father God, we thank you for Jesus. I want to ask you now, as you sit there with your eyes closed and your head bowed, take a moment, reflect, are you compromising? Have you compromised? Is there an area? Is there a place? Is there a relationship? Is there a thought? Is there someone? Jesus can get you out. His message to you is repent. Find your fulfillment and satisfaction in Him. Find your name and your identity in Him. Let Him give you Himself. Let him give you a name. So Jesus, we come. We're humbled. We repent. And we will be set free. Yes, Jesus. So Lord, do your work in us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.